Hello, my name is Richard Smith. I'm with Ocean State Productions and WODP TV. I want to come to you this morning, this afternoon, and talk about something that recently happened in my life. Um, I stopped working on Alaska Christian Mission about a year and a half ago. It was February of 2020. I stopped. And I took a break and I believe God asked me to put it on the back burner for now, not to give up on it, not to forget about it, but just to put it on the back burner. I believe that God was showing me something else he wanted me to do. And I want to tell you that story today. And I want to tell you what happened this week as I finally got to take a look at this land in person. Later on, I'm going to show you the video of what I recorded of the land. And I didn't record a lot. But I did show the beauty that is there. Um, last year, I started, I uh, was looking at this website that I checked out from time to time about land in Maine because I had always thought about maybe going back there and retiring one day. Um, land is pretty cheap up there, there's a lot of it for a good price. It's not like around here, land's very expensive around here. So I uh, was looking at this website and I saw this piece of land, 400 acres. I thought, well, why not? I'll take a look, you know, couldn't hurt to look. And I went down to the road and I was scanning around through Google Earth looking at everything and I saw this church up on the hill. So I went up in front of the church off the road and I turned to look at the church and sure enough, this church was designed the way that I believe God had started showing me what to build in Alaska. Now, the, the style of this place that I believe God was showing me to build um, is called a Texas barn frame. It has two sides on it and then a metal that goes up. I don't think I've ever seen a church like that before. Now, there may be churches like that that I haven't seen, but um, and my idea was to build this place that way so that it could handle the snow load of Alaska. Um, also be able to use the sides for uh, Sunday school classes, uh, possibly a place for teens to sleep or people to sleep or missionaries to sleep or whatever. Um, a middle for the meeting area, the huge living room, um, community area and a kitchen and then the upstairs would probably be used as my place of residence and so I saw this vision and I saw the farm and I saw how if I could build a farm there that I could invite young people to come in that may be troubled that may be needing some help to be a big brother to um, just work with kids that may need special attention and having a farm setting we could teach them one of the one of I think is one of the most uh, perfect gift that God could give us in that we learn how to grow our own food um, to be self-sustained and so learning how to grow your own food will give you a chance to feed yourself <laughs> if the grocery stores close down um, so this place was something that I saw um, at that time when I started that uh, I did not know my grandson had autism I saw this place as a place to help children and teens that were homeless to give them a place to, to stay to work to feel important to, to hear God's love and to feel God's love in their everyday life and this was the goal that I set out to build, a place to help homeless people, to help homeless teenagers, to help homeless families. And I worked on this goal for, well, really hard for about a year and a half to two years, but altogether I worked on it for about five years, uh, kind of here and there, what I could do. Um, but. You know what the most important thing about that was? God was taking that and he was helping 
mold me or molding me into what I needed to be for him later on down the road. I was learning things that I had never looked at before. God was using that, I believe, as a way of teaching me something. Um, so when I gave up, put that on the back burner, I wouldn't say give up because I never gave up, but when I put that on the back burner, I said, all right, I'll revisit this and you know, when God's ready for me to. I um, started looking at the land and I saw the land and I want to point out a couple things that you guys are going to think are just circumstances possibly. You're going to think, well, maybe Richard, that's not God talking to you. That's just circumstances. Well, I disagree. Now, some people will call me a dreamer. Some people will say that I have big dreams and no way of fulfilling those dreams. But I want to point out that if you believe, if you truly believe that God can do anything, then you're not worried about what you can do. You know that God can do it. You just have to have the faith to push through even when the times are hard, even when it doesn't feel like it's working. You have to have the faith in what you see to make it work for God. A recent Bible verse that came up to me in the Sunday morning preaching a couple of weeks ago is a verse now that I take to heart. And that verse is Galatians 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 6. It talks about uh, circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't matter. Only faith working through love. Only faith working through love. That's what matters. We have to love God with every ounce of our body. We have to be willing to do whatever it takes, whether we want to or not, whether we, we are going to benefit from it or not. Um, some people ask, why are we here? What purpose do we have? Why did God create Adam and Eve? My personal opinion is this, and I'm going to show you my personal opinion because everybody has their own opinions about why they're here. But God loved us from the day he formed Adam and Eve. He loved us. We were created to be with him, talking with him, being with him, sharing with him loving him that's why we were created we weren't created to have fancy houses fancy cars a lot of money the best paying jobs we weren't created to have a statue that stands with our name on it or a big accomplishment that will mean nothing in 100 years or 500 years or 2,000 years. Everything that we do in this life for God is the only thing that matters. Now we have to make money to survive. We have to have money to pay our bills. We have to have money to eat. This is all true. And so we have to find that balance between doing what it takes to, to survive and doing what it takes to serve God. Now, I'm gonna get into the property. So when I saw this church and I saw it was shaped in a Texas barn frame, which is the design that I was wanting to, that I had seen to build in Alaska, I thought, wow, this is a great thing. This is very cool. I said, but it's just one circumstance. Uh, and so I started researching the church. I found out that the church's sides had been struck by lightning. The church itself had been struck by lightning. And there's a picture of the church that I hope to show you where the sides are completely down. About 12, 13 years ago, that happened. And they built the sides on it to make it look the way it does today. Now, does that mean that it, lightning struck and it benefited me and God's had a plan 12 years ago for me to see this? Well, I don't know if I'd go to say all that. I believe that God has a reason for everything, and it doesn't just benefit or, or go along with what I believe. It benefits and helps so many other people, and that church is very beautiful. I've been inside that church now, and it's a great uh, church for God. 
So the church was struck by lightning to build the sides. The pastor's name is Andy or Andrew. I got to meet Andy on this trip and I'm very thankful for the moments that I got to spend with him inside this church. Um, church is Baptist in the same belief I am. And then I saw the school next door, kindergarten through 12th grade school with a soccer field in the back. You guys know I've coached soccer for many, many years. And I thought, well, this is really all nice. Um, coincidence, I believe, not circumstance is the word I want to use. Uh, there are a lot of coincidences. And I had my doubts, like a lot of you go. That, you know, these are all coincidences, Richard. You're, you're not hearing from God. You're making more of it than it really is. And so I did what I did when I started my research on Alaska, and I googled teen suicide in Maine instead of just teen suicide. The first time it was just teen suicide. And that brought up Alaska because at that time, Alaska was three times greater in teen suicide than anywhere else in the United States. And since I've coached soccer for many years, my desire is to work with teens and help young people, especially those who are troubled and thinking about committing suicide. And I came across a page that said, and I'm going to show it to you here, it says Michelle Rock hired as head of autism and disorders, and I'm forgetting the exact wording, in the state of Maine. And I saw that and I thought, now this is going to sound crazy to a lot of y'all, but I've been single for many, many years, five years I believe now, close to it. And I had come to the conclusion through a lot of prayer and a lot of soul searching, wondering why I was still single, why God had not chose me to be with someone yet. I had come to the conclusion that the name Michelle might mean something to me. My first little girl that I ever had a crush on in first grade, her name was Michelle. I still remember her face. I can't remember her last name. I actually have tried to look her up a long time ago. First girl I ever kissed, her name was Michelle. My first girlfriend was named Michelle. Ironically, my last wife's middle name was Michelle. And that should have told me something, but at that time, I believe God was using that for me to have me waiting for a woman named Michelle because the name Michelle would be something so important to me that I would need to wait for her. Well, when I saw that Michelle Rock had been hired as the head of autism and disorders in the state of Maine, it floored me. Her name was Michelle. Her last name was Rock. Now what does Christ tell us to build our foundation on? Solid rock. And then I put something together that I never put together before with the name Michelle and that she is the head of autism. My grandson who just turned nine has a very severe autism. He has epilepsy, really bad. He has drop seizures. He's got a vagus device put in his chest for his seizures. He takes five or six medicines and has that device in him. And he has my name, Richard Farrell Smith the Fourth. When I saw this, and I saw that the name Michelle was linked to my grandson with autism, I felt like crying like I am right now. The name Michelle was not meant to be me waiting for my soulmate's name Michelle. It was to link my grandson with autism to this place. I still, like a lot of you, go, gosh, that's a lot of uh, coincidences, God. You know, part of our problem with faith is that we could have a neon sign in front of us, God pointing in direction, and we'd still doubt. I 
I uh, prayed about it. I was on the fence. I said, okay, God, buying a piece of 400 acres of land for $375,000, that's a lot more than I can do personally. There's no way I can do that, God. There's no way I can do that. Do you hear what I just said? There's no way I can do that. Do you truly believe that God can do anything? Do you truly believe that if God is in control, if God wants it to happen, it will happen? Now, this was the question I had to ask myself. Somewhere on all this, God started showing me what I later found out was a movie. But I saw this vision, and the question was, how are angels formed? It came to my mind. And my vision showed me a teardrop coming out of God's eyes, and that teardrop falling to the ground, and that teardrop becoming an angel. And so I got curious, and I started researching angels, and I didn't even know at that time that Gabriel was the angel that came to um, Joseph and Mary and told them to leave. And I started learning, and I saw this vision of this movie I didn't realize it was a movie at the time, but I saw this vision of this story that God was putting into my, my mind. And it was about a little girl who had autism, who had a white dog that would be her companion, who was protected by God and the archangels against Lucifer and his demons. And I saw this movie unfold in my head. I saw the beginning, I saw the end. I cried every time I saw it. I've got a good imagination, folks, but this was sent from God. And I told God somewhere in all this, I said, God, I can't remember the exact timeline, so forgive me if I get a little messed up. I said, God, I hear you. I'm going to listen to that preacher up in Maine at that church one Sunday morning on Facebook, and if he says something that I believe that you're trying to tell me, I'll know this is what I'm supposed to do. And so I listened that Sunday morning to the pastor, and he preached on one verse, and I'm going to put it up here so you can read it. But it's James chapter 1, verse 27, and it's the Holman Christian uh, Bible that I've quoting here it says pure and undefiled religion is this to assist in the aid of orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself undefiled from the world God clearly defines what we're supposed to do pure and undefiled religion is this to keep one to assist in the aid of orphans and widows in their distress and I saw this, and I heard this, and I'm cried some more. I've been a crybaby here lately, I'm going to tell you. But it's tears of joy. I took that, and I called a place called A Family For Me. And I did the research, and I found out that when I talked with a lady on the phone, that 25 out of every 100 kids that go through the foster program there at that particular place have some form of autism. 25 out of 100. 25% of the kids that go through there have some type of autism. And because they have some type of autism, they are a lot harder to place than a child that doesn't. They have medical needs. They have a lot of needs, more than a normal child. And when I saw this, and I put the Bible verse together to assist in the aid of orphans and widows in their distress. Now, to me, distress could be defined as teen suicide. And ironically, well, teen suicide is also high in teens with autism because they're just tired of living the way they're living. But distress in my book could be defined as autism 
epilepsy, anything that is a disorder that causes our body to not function properly. And so when I saw this and I saw all that linked together, I cried again. I finally got down and I told God I'll do it. I committed myself to it. I took my granddaughter and my best friend Anna and we went to this fancy restaurant. I had a cake made that said autistic hearts on it and a number zero on the top to, to say that this was the date that autistic hearts was born. Now, the question still rang in my mind, how was I going to raise the kind of money to build a place to help autistic kids, children with distress and, and issues? And the movie was there, Autistic Hearts. It started off as the name God's Promise because I wanted to make clear that God's promise is that He is always with us he is always there with us. He always takes care of us. He always watches over us. God's promise is that He will always be with us. And when I saw everything about autism and the land up in Maine, I changed the name to Autistic Hearts because I just believe that's the name God was telling me to use. Autistic Hearts would not only be the name of the movie, but it would be the name of the community that was going to be built one day to help autistic children. So my goal then was to make this movie, but COVID was around. And so I finally came to my partner in WODP-TV, my, my partner and my friend, and Pastor Andy Clapp, him and I sat down and uh, started WODP TV, Ocean State Productions, about three years ago. And I said, Andy, why don't we make this movie? And we'll take the money, some of the money, not all of it, but some of the money from this movie, and we would try to buy this land if that's what we felt like God wanted us to do. And with that, we would start the community called Autistic Hearts. Now, one of the things that had always kept me from trying to do this was something very simple. And, and it's something that, that I want to talk about because I want you to understand it. I want you to see it. I sometimes look at life as what am I going to do? What can I accomplish? I'm 53 years old right now. What can I accomplish in the next 20, possibly 30 years? 20 years of good health, maybe, time I hit 73. Yeah. What could I personally accomplish that would make a difference in a child's life? And it was that Christmas time when I learned about the Masonic Home for Children in Oxford. And I went up there and I talked with, um, forgive me, I forgot his name at the moment, but I, I talked with a gentleman up there and um, he showed me around and he gave me a tour. And what I started to see was this place was 148 years old. Whoever started this place obviously wasn't still around. Whoever started this place does not have a chance to see it the way it is now unless he's looking down from heaven. But this place was built over 148 years to where it is today. And I then began to understand that if I bought the land in Maine and somehow started something, or got someone else to start something, it may not be something that I get to finish, but it's something that God wants to happen. And I stopped looking at it as if what I could do, and I started looking at it as if what God could do. And that's the important part. Part of my journey through Alaska Christian Mission and to where I am today is learning that my life is about serving God. 
and making him happy. It's not about what I want. It's not about what I can obtain. So I'm going to skip through. Uh, I finally got to go up and look at this main, the landed main, a year and a half later. I went up last, left here last Monday morning. I drove all the way up there nonstop. Took Gabriel, my dog. Got up there, did a little looking around. I realized when I started looking around that I no longer had a desire personally to be there in this property. It was more about what God had in store for me to do. And I called the pastor and I met him. And I met him at the church and I looked at the property. It's one of the first things I did when I got there. I looked at the property and then I went on. It was kind of early in the morning. There was a lot of fog and I couldn't see it that well. So I knew I was going to have to come back. So I went and did what I needed to do and then I called the pastor and I met him again. I met him at the church at like 12 o'clock after some of the fog had lifted. And we had a chance to talk. And one of the questions I had was, and I had this question a long time ago, I remember asking Andy in his office, I said, you know what Andy I can't understand is why God showed me this vision and not the people in the church. The people in the church are next to the land. They, God could have given this vision to them. Why did he choose me when I am 1,100 miles away 